So, more than Goodman. This is an example of a little Yankee house that was first uh, bought with a farm by a Jewish farmer. And he lived in this little, uh, probably early 19th or late 18th century house. And as his prosperity grew, he built a larger house and turned the original one into a, into a barn. Now, one of, the, one of the things that we continually heard when we started this project was that every, every, Jew, every Jewish farmer got cheated on their property. And, you know, I think that you have to realize that Connecticut farms are small. They're not going to be farms that you would see in Iowa. They're not going to be that kind of great, great land. Um, I don't think that uh, they always got a bad deal, but Connecticut is not one of those large scale farming type of states. It's just not. Uh, and I, it was a very tough lifestyle to make a success out of. But I think that the JES, with this farm agent, we try to find the best property possible with the most amount of goods that you could get with it. This is Chesterfield. And you can see that Chesterfield looks almost just like this now. <laughs> so you can see that when my friend Nancy was looking for the pants factory, she couldn't figure out where it was. Chesterfield is the earliest farming community we know of in the state. They built a synagogue as early as uh, 1890. And they uh, were a congregation that moved out of Brooklyn, New York, uh, before the JAS really had their whole social service program together. So they were sent to Chesterfield, Connecticut, and uh, they, had a, they had a rabbi and a small group of families. And after that, they were really almost the guinea pig community for the JAS in Connecticut. So the JAS decided they did fund this uh, creamery that was in operation for a few years. They helped them build their synagogue. This is the synagogue. And they, they, they told them that they ought to come up with an Americanized name. So they were, had been like a Buddhist king, and they changed their name from the name of Buddhist king, which is what they've been in Brooklyn, to the New England Hebrew Farmers of the Emanuel Society. <laughs> and so all their deeds and everything have this huge long name. And the wonderful thing about this is that the, all the original synagogue records exist for this congregation. They're in Yiddish, and they're being translated, and they'll be published uh, next year. This little building cost $900 and was partially funded by the JAS. And in the 1970s, before we really started to appreciate this history, it was burned by vandals. It's now an archaeological site and listed on the National Register. Now, keeping the faith, synagogues were not permitted by law in Connecticut until 1843. In that law, the uh, Connecticut General Assembly enacted uh, the uh, statute that says that Jews who may desire to unite and form religious societies shall have the same rights and privileges that are given to Christians of every denomination, unquote. Jews settling in the countryside at the end of the 19th century were on their own in constructing a Jewish life for themselves and their families in an overwhelmingly Gentile environment. Evidence of, these, of the Jewish faith of these farm families emerged in the building of places of worships, worship in these rural communities, some of which are still standing. And you'll learn more about yours coming up in the next, in the next couple of events. Uh, but uh, initially, services were held in farmers' houses, and then you might get a traveling uh, rabbi for, for services. Uh, but by 1918, for example, Colchester's Orthodox Synagogue had become a major draw for Jewish business owners. Now, country synagogues are found today in uh, Columbia, East Cata, Ellington, Hebron, Lisbon, and Newtown. Two are known to have received construction loans from the Baron de Hirsch Fund, Chesterfield, and Ellington. There may have been others that have been lost. Some may still be standing converted to other uses. But this one is an outstanding example. Normally, the uh, typical country synagogue in Connecticut was constructed in wood. And it's usually one and a half stories. And um, it has to, had to correspond 
with several of the important practices that govern synagogues. And the ones that have the biggest effect on these, co these country synagogues in terms of traditional practice, the first was that uh, being forbidden to ride on the Sabbath, that meant in the country that this <coughs> ordinance kept a low, uh, a low figure, the number of families who could belong to a congregation. And there, there's different nuances to that. Some people say their, their parents would drive to a certain spot and park <laughs> and then walk. Because um, it, it's a really tough, it's tough to figure out how to locate or where to put your synagogue where you think you really have to walk. So there was a little, seemed to be a little flexibility that went on with that. Um, the second requires a minion, a quorum of 10 uh, adult male Jews required for the establishment of congregation and for recitation of certain parts of the service. And the third, pursuant to the standard Orthodox practice, seats women separately from men. Now normally, and this is true I think of the East Haddo Synagogue, uh, such seating was in galleries. And so there are balconies in a couple of these. But uh, in, a, in a small one, I'm going to show you in a minute, they were just divided by a curtain. And that's true of the Chesterfield one and this one in Columbia that I'm going to show you. Because the buildings are just too small to have a balcony or a gallery. So, um, this is Hebron. Now, Hebron is really interesting because it's brick and it's Art Deco. It was built in 1940. And it really is an interesting story because it was designed by a member of their congregation. And his tale is one that I think is common. His family tried farming outside of Bridgeport. They failed. They went back to the city. They tried farming again here. They, they failed during the Depression. They went back. They struggled with farming here. Uh, he was in high school in the, in the Depression in the 1930s, and he was artistically gifted. And if his family would have had the wherewithal, he would, wanted to be an art student and be an artist. But instead, his family just did not have those kinds of resources. So he ends up running the uh, feed and supply company, uh, general store, but mostly feed and supply company in Amstead, uh, in Amstead, Connecticut. And he publishes a town newsletter, and he also designs the synagogue. And then it's 1940, so we're on the edge of, we're leaving the Depression, and we're on the edge of the war. So this is made out of used bricks that they got in Hartford from demolished buildings that they would carefully chip out and line up, and it was a real community effort. Just so unusual with this Art Deco design. Alright, technology. There we go. Here's the inside. And they have, their, their, their uh, sanctuary has got these hand-painted murals. And I want to think that that was Ari Tertium, but there's no verification as to who actually painted them. These, these synagogues have wonderful arms and they have wonderful curtains. Now this is Columbia. Uh, and this one is built in two parts. The first part goes from the edge to the doorway. That was before 1951. This area had an influx of Jews that came after the Second War to become farmers in the area. So they added the section that you see on the, your right uh, to enlarge it, the little piece on the end. And this is one of them that has a curtain that just divides the women's section from the men's section. This one is, its future is up in the air because it's got a, a tiny congregation. They had have, they have high holidays last year, but there's no real um, plan for the future of the building. This is the, the new edition, the 1951 edition. And this is the, in, in the inside. These hand-carved um, lines of Judah, I just think, are wonderful, as are the embroidered curtains. <laughs> now, this one is Lisbon. This is right outside of Jewett City. And if you saw this building on the corner of your eye if you were driving by, wouldn't you think it was a one-room schoolhouse? 
I know I would, but it was built as a synagogue. It had a group of families that, that got together uh, to follow. It was built in 1936 to follow Orthodox practice. It's just beautiful. It's a little colonial revival building. It's always had the, that star of David. Uh, Ken Levo, who is a scholar we worked, at on, worked with on this project, took the school bus by this building every day. And he, it's around a bend. And he always felt very reassured as a Jewish kid sitting on his school bus in the 1940s to see his synagogue around the corner. This is the in interior, which is original. This is how it was set up for service. Now this building was threatened because once again, the congregation had dwindled down and there was no future for the building. And what happened was that the historical society uh, was given the building. They restored the building. It's open for visitation. We, we include it on our bus tours when we, when we go. They're very proud of it. And it's a real symbol of the preservation of really what's becoming kind of a hidden history of Jews in agriculture in Eastern Connecticut. And once again, I love the, the, the doves were carved by, at the top were carved by a member of the congregation. And this is Ellington. Ellington has a large, uh, active community of Jewish farmers. And this is Newtown. Now Newtown, this building is now empty. It, Newtown is in a suburban area closer to New York, so they have a, lar a larger, more suburban congregation. And so they built their new building next door. So we're waiting to see what happens to their old building. This is what it looked like originally. This was taken in 1940. So now let's talk a little bit about the resorts. Um, farming was not all that took place on Jewish run farms. And everybody at Muda's knows that. Uh, providing lodging for Jewish summer guests became a common way for Jewish farmers to make ends meet. Farm families found themselves catering to fellow Jews drawn by the promise of fresh food prepared in kosher kitchens, synagogues to worship in, and a respite from smoldering summer, summers in New York City tenements. The host farmers could be counted on to uphold Jewish dietary laws. The services of shokets were obtained for preparing fowl, and by the 1920s, kosher butcher stores could be found in small uh, country communities such as Colchester. Without air conditioning, summer in New York City was stifling. Hartford Current reporter Isabel Foster described the summer influx of Jews to Colchester in central Connecticut in an area known as the Connecticut Catskills. This is about 1915, she says. In the summer, the population jumps to 10,000 because of the summer visitors from the tenements of New York. Those who do not like to see a dignified and quiet old town turned into a resort for city workers should soften their hearts by spending a hot week in August sleeping in a courtroom on the Upper East Side of New York. It will then be a matter of rejoicing to them that these poor people can get away to the green country for a few weeks. They will look at with the light in the sheds labeled banquet hall where a long table and two benches serve as the only furniture, and as the hammocks hung in the rundown apple orchards, even the noisy groups who gather in the town's little stores, unquote. And I guess it, you'll see on the bus tour, and there's an exhibit at the Historical Society, uh, downtown Mood has had that, that same look that you see here in downtown Colchester. Right? People would walk down to town. Now, a cook lane, literally a cook-for-yourself arrangement was typical. This meant that guests cooked their own food in the farm kitchen or in the summer kitchen set up in another building. The farmer would profit not only by receiving the weekly rent, but by also selling fresh ingredients to the guests. The farm family would move out of their bedrooms and into the barn. Farm boarding houses that provided meals as well as rooms were less common. But as Pinkus Schwartzberg's advertisement for the Elm Farmhouse in Mansfield calls the farm quote, a first-class a first -class summer place with an elegant summer kept garden, fresh butter, milk, and eggs every day, and fine spring water, unquote. Unlike today's famous fat farms, which are spas that promise guests that they'll lose weight during their stay, Connecticut's early 20th century 
Jewish farm hosts prided themselves on putting weight on their city guests. <laughs> the Elm Farmhouse boarders traveled by train from Grand Central Station to Willimannock to be picked up by the farm wagon or by the Chelsea boat to Norwich and continued on by car, presumably streetcar, to their destination. Food was essential to the uh, Jewish identity. Quote, my mother in the early days milked cows by hand, and you have to remember she cooked everything we ate. Nothing bought was ready-made. She made farmer's cheese that hung on a line outside. She worked very hard, quote, relates Eastern uh, Connecticut Jewish farmer Harvey uh, Polinsky. Saul Mendel described his parents' accommodation for boarders, quote, there were several bungalows. One was originally an ice house. One was originally a chicken coop. The city of Norwich disposed of their trolley cars and we were able to obtain, obtain one and turn it into a bungalow. <laughs> Saul Kayaktik from Lebanon remembered, my mother charged $18 a week for room and board. That was very reasonable. For the rumor, it was $80 for the season. Farm guests staying in farmhouses, some places uh, then developed into resorts. Resort buildings included boarding houses, cottages, hotels, bungalows, and camps that offered, often offered waterfront recreation, dining halls, and nightly entertainment. More than 30 small resorts were identified by our historians in the research report Back to the Land. Famous Jewish entertainers such as Zero Mostel, a cousin of Jack Banner who built Banner Lodge in 1934 on the site of his father's farm in Moudis, traveled the Borscht Belt, a tour circuit that included venues in New York, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut during the summer to perform at these family-oriented resorts. This one, I, uh, you'll probably recognize, but I, they advertise at the bottom, you'll love our own Jewish American cuisine. In 1936, Sam and uh, Irma Arnstein stayed at Banner Lodge. They wrote the following postcard to their parents in Brooklyn. Quote, since Irma wrote last, she had chicken six times. We played indoor baseball, tennis, and I went swimming yesterday. This morning we took a six mile walk which knocked your daughter out so she'll probably take a nap in the afternoon before rowing before supper. Then we will walk to the village. More tomorrow, regards and love, Sam and Irma. Uh, most people who collect postcards want the ones that are mint that have never been sent anywhere. I want the ones that are written on, that have all the information, that have been sent to somebody. Uh, I have a postcard that the banner sent out to try to get more visitors, even mid-season. In July 1955, the Banner Lodge sent a handwritten postcard to a former guest from New Jersey that reads, quote, while our sports activities are at their best this year, we thought you'd be interested to know that we have added, for those who are inclined to relax, plenty of chase lounges around our Olympic pool, plus a modernistic outside stage for afternoon dance fests and music siestas. Whether you want to play or relax is your choice. And in the August of 1964, a postcard, for, postcard from the Banner family reads, wish you were here, having a wonderful time. You can too by making reservations now for either guest staff reunion week in August or Labor Day or Rosh Hashanah holidays. Most of these resorts survive and are now uh, youth camps or religious retreat houses. So let's look at a few of those. Here's Winers. This is Denver's resort. This is now condominiums. This is in Colchester. There it is now. There's Mr. Denver. This is the Broadway house in Colchester, which it, uh, the building is still there. Levy's Grand View. This is in, this is it's in Colchester, outside of Colchester, and it's around a, a lake. And the entire property is on the market right now. Pools were very prestigious. This is the Grand View Hotel in Buddhist, the swimming pool. I love this one. This is says submarine lights underwater for night bathing. <laughs> and then it lists all these activities that you can do. That's the Grand View Hotel. 
we'll be going by that site and talking a little bit about that on our, on our tour. This is Grand Lake Lodge in Lebanon, which is still there. It was run by a family who had their egg farm across the street. This, this scene is pretty uh, much like it is now. There it is today. <clears throat> this is the Stories Hotel in Mansfield. And these were typical, these were two, um, even though the Mansfield Hotel doesn't say, it doesn't sound terribly Jewish, it was a Jewish hotel. And these are two New York visitors. Now, Orchard Mansion, this is the dead of winter. I'm going to have to get a better slide. We'll be stopping at this on the bus tour. This is in mint condition. And then Banner Lodge, which of course now uh, is not there anymore. <coughs> But this was a this is what's called the Suzanne Cottage at Banner Lodge. Here's an average, one of their brochures. A lot of people say they've met their husband or wives at Banner Lodge because they work there. These are the girls at the desk, I suppose card says. <laughs> and these are the tennis courts. And you gotta have the pool. The lake. Here, you also have little or little operations that were spin-offs. Harry's is famous. Every Colchester High School student has worked there, and the Board of Health has tried to close it for years, but um, it opens every summer, and it has it's it's just famous as a food stop. There are also little storekeepers that. Um, opened businesses in these small towns and yet when we go to the East Town Historical Society they, they have a display on Buddhas like this. This happens to be Zucker Barms in Jewett City and the um, little store here, uh, the parents opened it in the 1920s. They were Yiddish speakers and they lived above the store and then they were able to open, um, expand out to the, the little sh store front on the right hand side. And they called it an apartment store. I love that. So, in closing, let's see how they did. This newspaper article says, Jews are taking to agriculture. And I would say, not surprisingly, many Jewish farmers did not make it. Economic panic, depression, or collapse of farm prices occurs with regularity every decade and a half. As early as the 1860s, many Yankee farmers had given up farming for mill work or moved west for more productive land. But many of Connecticut's <coughs> Jewish farmers did make it. In a newspaper article in the Hartford Current in 1915, now this is the headline. This entire thing is the headline. Jewish farmers prosper in Connecticut, living down their reputation as mere millmen who do no labor. They have shown they can till the soil and make it pay. Unquote. <laughs> Reporter Isabel Foster credited the JAS and its sponsored farmers for their commercial success and literally creating something out of nothing. What were the factors that contributed to the success of those farmers who thrived in Connecticut? In some cases, it was just good luck. A good location with close proximity to urban areas, including Hartford, New Haven, New London, Norwich, or Willow Manor, that provided demand for fresh eggs, milk, meat and produce or non-food stuffs like tobacco and afforded access to trolley, truck, and train for the transportation of produce to market. Important nutritional discoveries like milk's vitamin A and the development of sanitary, scientifically designed farm buildings benefited all farmers. The help of the Connecticut Agricultural College at Stores, where the first Jewish student was enrolled in 1898, and the State Department of Agriculture and their farm agents ended farmers' isolation and kept them informed. But Jewish farmers also had a powerful ally. The JAS, with, it, with its own farm agents, farm publications in Yiddish as well as English, and perhaps most important, money to lend, often as a second or third mortgage. These are the essentials that provided individual farm families some resources for them to be able then to take their own ingenuity and business savvy in turning a worn out Yankee farm 
into a flourishing dairy or poultry farm, summer resort, or after World War II, an agribusiness. The full impact of Connecticut's Jewish farmers in Connecticut is just coming to light. The lives of those earliest arrivals in the 1890s and the post-World War II immigrants both need more research before their unique role in Connecticut's agricultural history is fully revealed. Thank you. Farmers in the group, or people who worked at the resorts, or ran a resort. We have Davis Poultry Farm too. Oh, Moody's. Davis Pol Poultry Farm and Moody's. And how many years did you run the fa that farm? Long time. Long time. Yeah. We have a, um, a goat dairy in East Africa. And what's the name of the farm? Summer Self Farm. There we go. Great. And this is our hostess at the Historical Society uh, when we stop for the bus tour. So there we go. And I might say also that our farm um, had been uh, owned by a Jewish family that maintained it for some years as a resort. Oh. It was a resort too. And it was called Pleasant View. Pleasant View. For a nice to Nice. Good. We have to get that history down. Did it, anybody remember staying at these resorts? Or working at them? What is it? What resort did you want to say? Oh, no. Did you, did you work at a resort? Or? Oh, I worked in London and lived on North Hoover's Road. And yeah. we know all the resorts. And I'll be on the phone. Oh, great. Good. We've got an expert. That's good. Oh, we have, okay. Now, we actually have a verified story of somebody whose parents met and fell in love and married because they met at Banner Lodge. I hear that story, but it's nice to meet somebody that that happened to. My dad had a poultry farm down in Connecticut, in Jersey. This was in 1955. That was started with 13,000 chickens, wound up with 26,000 chickens. Uh, and I worked at a place that was a Jewish resort, uh, Green's Hotel. Oh, Green's Hotel, yeah. I've heard of that one. Yes, yeah, so it went from 13,000 chickens to 26,000 chickens. Wow. And did you have those industrial, those big industrial coops? We had one that was like that. Yeah. At held 13,000. Um, yeah, that's maybe one of the questions we get on this topic is, so why, you know, why aren't, what happened to Jewish farmers? And I think uh, there's a, it's a complicated answer to that question. I think that there were more uh, people, uh, generation after the Second War, had more opportunities to choose an occupation, and farming is a tough life. It's very hard, it's very physical, you really have to like it to enjoy it. Um, so I think that that was one thing. Connecticut became more suburbanized and less agricultural because I think as we took all these country roads to come up with our route for the bus tour, you think of these beautiful country homes and you don't necessarily think of this as a farming area now when you drive through, you think, oh, I would love to have that country home or this nice, this nice house. But it doesn't strike you as an agricultural area unless you know that you're going to a certain wonderful farm stand or a certain farm. So that's part of it too. And then I think the other factor is this big industrialization of farming that just overtook family farms in general, where you have thousands of acres that are conglomerated in places like Iowa and Illinois. You can't compete with those that scale of farming uh, as a small farmer. So, well, thank you so much, and I hope to see you on the bus tour. One more. Did you, go, did you go further afield? Because I know somebody that came over from Israel and went to a, a poultry farm in Guilford. Oh, I would, if you have a name, uh, you could give it to me afterwards. That would be nice. Yeah, because we're looking at it statewide, so that would be terrific. Okay.
Well, thank you so much, and thank you, Rabbi. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mary. And I, I also wanted to thank Sandy for its uh, thank you, because she was really the person organizing this and, the, and your whole team. So thank you so much. And I also want to point out Ellen Nobleman. Where is Ellen? Okay, good. Because Ellen is, and her team, they're writing a book, Mary, and we'll have a chapter in it. And that book will be available and printed and distributed to members of the congregation, hopefully mid-November. Yes, am I right? Sign up for the bus tour. Sign up for the bus tour. Thank you very much, Mary. Oh, you're going to help Grandpa. There you go.